Welcome back to Paul's Tech News, everyone, and welcome to the first day of spring 2022. I should probably change up my background. One sec. Wallpaper. There, springtime. That's much better. Birds are chirping, animals are procreating, and both flowers and the tech news stories are blooming in a glorious and aromatic bouquet that's sure to set off your seasonal allergies. Indeed, the pervasive joy that this season of renewal brings can only be tempered by the reminder that some people live in the southern hemisphere, where I can only assume that this is the first day of anti-spring, when all that is green and good begins to wither, and the grim-faced citizens prepare to cull the excess bunny population with the first weekly extermination sweep. Australia has some strange traditions, I guess is what I'm trying to say, but for the rest of us, it's time to emerge from our winter dens to breathe the fresh air and feel the warm sun on our faces once again, at least for a minute, whilst we quickly spring clean our PCs and then get back inside to resume that 12-hour gaming session. And thus, the cycle of life continues. Excellent! Today's video was brought to you by the new Lightwings fans from Be Quiet, which combine legendary near-silent operation with optimal performance and, of course, RGB lighting. Control the look of your PC with up to 20 addressable LEDs per fan, and choose from standard PWM for airflow or PWM high speed for use with radiators and heat sinks. They're available in 120mm and 140mm sizes, and suitable for any build in need of a functional and tasteful RGB upgrade. So for more on the new Lightwings fans from Be Quiet, click the sponsor link in the video description. We begin today with a bunch of news from AMD which basically came in two drops this week, one on Tuesday and one on Thursday. Tuesday's info confirmed much of what we discussed last week. AMD has new AM4 CPUs coming in April, the last hurrah for the venerable platform that originally launched in March 2017, alongside first-gen Ryzen CPUs like the 1800X. There are seven new CPUs in total, and in my opinion, every single one should come with an asterisk or forewarning of one kind or another, starting with the big one for all of them, which is that AM4 is going end of life this year, so future-minded builders might consider holding out for the next-gen AM5 platform, which will launch sometime in the second half of 2022. At the bottom of the new CPU stack, though, we have the 4-core 8-thread 4100 and the 6-core 12-thread 4500 and 4600G, which you should know are still Zen 2-based, not Zen 3. So still 7 nanometer chips, but using slightly older architecture that originally launched in summer 2019. Still, the boosted core and thread counts should be competitive versus Intel's offering down in this $100 to $150 price range. The 4600G also has integrated Vega 7 graphics, which could supplant the 5600G as an entry-level gaming PC option for anyone without the budget for a discrete graphics card, but reduced IPC performance and cache sizes versus true Zen 3 chips means these CPUs will age more quickly. The 6-core 12-thread Ryzen 5 5500, meanwhile, is a true Zen 3 chip, but it's Cezanne-based, aka the same underlying design as the 5600G APU, which means half the cache capacity and only PCI Express 3.0 support, which especially sucks if you thought this budget $160 CPU might pair well with a budget $220-ish $6500 XT graphics card. Not the best idea in my opinion since that card is limited to a by 4 PCI Express connection, and it's sad that AMD's entry-level Ryzen and entry-level Radeon options don't pair up more harmoniously right now. The $200 6-core 12-thread Ryzen 5 5600 is perhaps a more appealing option, and it is a chip many have hoped for since the 5600X proved so popular. The 5600 is not based on Cezanne, though. It is a Vermeer chip, which means a full 32 megabytes of L3 cache and PCI Express 4.0 support. The 5700X is an 8-core, 16-thread CPU for 300 bucks, and is the 5800X's younger sibling with a 65-watt TDP instead of 105. Good to have this option, I suppose. My caveats would be that the 5800X has sold for $300 as well before and can often be found on sale for $320 to $340. Also, since the 5700X is an X CPU, it means no Wraith cooler is included in the box, which might have made it a more appealing option for budget-conscious builders who are looking for higher core and thread counts. All of these CPUs will be launching April 4th. And of course, the final CPU in that stack is the 5800X 3D, the one you've probably already heard about, which will be the 
first consumer chip to use AMD's 3D vCache technology that they first teased at Computex 2021. It launches on April 20th, 420, because AMD is apparently run by a bunch of reefer addicts. But technical marketing director and guy who's definitely not a narc, Robert Hollick, detached himself from the company drum circle for a few moments to provide some additional pre-launch details on Tuesday. After emerging from the smoke-filled room, suppressing a coughing fit, and just sort of staring vacantly for a few moments, Hollick confirmed much of what we already know. The 8-core 16-thread 5800X 3D will have 96 megabytes of L3 cache and a $450 sale price, or less than what I paid for my volcano, as he puts it, as well as a base clock of 3.4 gigahertz with a 4.5 gigahertz turbo. One detail was left out of the initial announcement, though, which is that the 5800X 3D is the first first Ryzen branded CPU that is not fully unlocked for overclocking. Bobby Hacks confirmed that somewhat disappointing news during a follow-up hotboxing session with Hot Hardware, where it was revealed that the chip will have a hard power limit of 1.35 volts to make sure everything runs smoothly with the new die stacking technology. You will still be able to overclock the Infinity Fabric and Memory Bus, thankfully, but I'm not sure why the AMD crew left that info out of the Tuesday briefings. Probably just a lapse in short-term memory. Oh. I almost forgot too. Uh, the final tidbit from Tuesday is that AMD will be providing official support for 5000 series CPUs on older AM4 motherboards with 300 series chipsets. Next month, AMD will roll out a GISA version 1.2.0.7, which can be rolled into UEFI updates for older boards to provide beta support for newer CPUs. That will be up to the manufacturer though, so if you're rocking a first gen AM4 board and looking to upgrade, your best bet is to contact your motherboard's manufacturer to see if they plan to provide an update for your specific board. And now we can move on from the AMD news to more AMD news. This time from the software side though, where on Thursday AMD launched the Spring 2022 update for their Radeon Adrenaline software package that handles GPU drivers and a host of other features. Version 22.3.1 includes the first revision of Radeon Super Resolution, an upscaling feature based on FX Super Resolution that can be implemented at the driver level, providing boosted frame rates and image quality improvements even for games that don't natively support FSR. It's only available on Radeon 5000 series GPUs and newer at launch, but AMD says they're evaluating whether to support older cards as well. And there's also FidelityFX Super Resolution 2.0, which promises to provide better image quality and higher frame rates versus version 1.0 by using temporal data, or previously rendered frames, to upscale the image. This hues a bit closer to Nvidia's DLSS than FSR has previously, although AMD has specified that machine learning is not involved, and initial feedback has been limited since AMD only provided a freeze frame comparison from Deathloop in the press material. That said, pixel peeping comparison videos are no doubt in the works, so keep an eye out for those if you're interested. Next we have Intel, who has finally provided an update on when they'll be updating us all on their upcoming Arc Discrete GPUs. The update date is Wednesday, March 30th at 8 a.m. Pacific time, when they'll be hosting a live stream so everyone can get a first look at our new Discrete graphics for laptops. Don't get me wrong, laptop GPUs are useful, but the desktop versions are what I think most of my audience are actually interested in. So it goes, but hopefully getting a first look will mean more this time than what they showed us at CES. Hey, here's our new GPU running a game. Bet you didn't think we could do that, huh? Run a game? Oh, you want official ARC GPU and memory specs and launch dates and pricing and comparative performance data across multiple games and resolutions? Well, did you hear we're calling them Alchemist? Doesn't that sound cool? Alchemist. Gu guys? Gu what? Guys, where are, you, where are you going? If you really want more on these ARC GPUs, maybe just pick one up from B&H, where a listing for a $1,350 Samsung Galaxy Book 2 Pro was spotted. A 15.6 inch laptop featuring a 12th gen core CPU and an unnamed ARC GPU, which videocards.com speculates is likely an A350M or A370M, one of the entry level options. The listing has been removed now though, so it's like it was never there and none of this ever happened. 
Speaking of things that deserve further scrutiny, remember all that stuff Apple said about their M1 ultra-powered Mac Studio last week? Turns out the wealth of data presented in those ultra-detailed charts was dubious at best, and independent reviews are already showing that comparative performance is not what Apple led its ever-discerning fanbase to believe. Gaming and OpenCL-based compute tests posted by The Verge show the Mac Studio system lagging behind, and while some might call out the power draw disparity between each solution, I would point out that the configuration The Verge tested cost $6,200 at retail, so if you're going to talk power, you'd better also be considering value, as a full RTX 3090 based system can easily be purchased for $4,000 to $5,000. But beyond the hard numbers, I think Apple does itself a disservice by pitching their products in this way, because it gives people like me ammunition to say, hey, there are a lot of ways you could get similar GPU or CPU compute performance for way less money. But that's not to say Macs do not have value, and their value often lies in the look and feel of the finished product, or the ecosystem, or their prowess at specific tasks like video editing. I also find information like this tweet from Marquez to be frustrating, because for me, if there's an M.2 slot in a PC, I'd better be able to swap whatever SSD is installed there for a bigger one, or a functional one if the original one fails. I'd like to be able to access the internals of my PC to clean it out as well, because PCs collect dust. And I'd prefer not to feel like I'm breaking the rules or voiding my warranty by doing so because of Apple's design choices. iFixit in this picture and Vadim Yuryev have both now cracked open their Mac Studios, and a full teardown was just posted by Max Tech. But a secret port in the bottom panel covered by an adhesive ring in order to access the inside isn't for me. I try my best to not to hate on Apple because I know a lot of people use their products and enjoy them, and that's fine, generally speaking. I've stayed away from Apple products simply because I don't think they're made or marketed towards someone like me who would actually like to take the damn things apart. Speaking of things that don't work on Apple devices, YouTube Vanced, popular Android app that is also just known as Vanced, shut down this week due to legal reasons. It was popular because it provided an arguably better experience than YouTube Premium, without the need to pay those pesky monthly fees that help in part to pay those fat cat creators whose content you voraciously consume on a daily basis. Background playback and no ads was just the start. Vanced could also skip sponsor ad integrations embedded in the video itself itself, force HDR or fixed high resolution video settings, pinch to zoom, and more. But now, no more, as Google sent a cease and desist to the team, and it is shutting down. Existing versions of Vanced should still work for another year or two, they say, but former users aren't necessarily rushing to sign up for YouTube Premium now if this Android Authority poll is any indication. Only 7% say they'll make the switch. Speaking of things that are getting worse instead of better, Microsoft accidentally rolled out a cool new feature for the Windows 11 File Explorer in a recent Insider build. Ads! That's right, even more ads in your face, inescapable and inexorable, guiding you towards that purchase that you didn't know you wanted to make. Now popping up as you simply try to browse your system drives to find that hidden folder where all your special exercise videos are. And while the ad itself is just some plain text pitching the Microsoft editor service, the potential for abuse seems high if this were to go live. But don't worry, Microsoft has recanted and said that they were just playing. It was a simple accident that was never meant to go live. They just instructed their developers to build out and test the File Explorer ad integrations and a preview build of the operating system completely by unhappy mishap, like when you trip and then accidentally rob a bank as you fall to the ground. Happens to us all. Keep doing what you're doing, Microsoft. All your decisions are the right ones. I'm glad you made the right decision today, though, because going commando can lead to chafage. That's why you remembered your tech briefs. GPU and CPU prices have been on the way back down, but unscrupulous malingerers are still doing their best to take advantage while the resale value is high, starting in China, where last weekend customs officials discovered a shipment of 5,840 XFX GPUs that were intentionally mislabeled to skirt import taxes. The total value of the shipment is an estimated 20 million RMB, around 3.15 million US dollars, and it remains to be seen if XFX will be held directly responsible. For now, their Chinese website is offline, and their official store on China's Tmall has apparently also been shut down. And then just a day later, in an unrelated incident, it was reported that an individual attempted to pass through Chinese customs with no fewer than 160 Intel 11th and 12th gen CPUs attached to his body. 
Not sure how they were attached, but this does seem like a perfect story to feature on Tech Briefs. Dubbed the walking CPU or CPU man, he was also carrying 16 mobile phones, but was given away by his abnormal walking posture, which happens to me all the time. And finally, in Russia, three perps were apprehended after attempting to steal 20 RTX 3070 Ti graphics cards from Russia's largest online retailer, which for some reason is called Wildberries. The $38,000 heist, yes, 38K, since 3070 Ti's go for just shy of two grand each these days, was captured by security cameras, but thankfully these GPU pilferers were captured soon afterward as well, since the first pawn shop they tried to sell to got suspicious and reported them. Crime doesn't pay. Speaking of petty thievery, Amazon has been accused of shenanigans yet again, this time because of shady tactics designed to keep people from canceling their Prime subscriptions. A project going back more than five years helped create a multi-step membership cancellation process, manipulates users through wording and graphic design, making the process needlessly difficult and frustrating to understand. And it worked, reducing dropped subscriptions by as much as 14% because users couldn't find the damn final cancellation page. You'd be right to think that people shouldn't have to venture on some protracted odyssey to do something as simple as cancel Prime, especially after they raised prices last month. But just to be clear, the Amazon folks in charge of this epic fail named it Project Iliad, Homer's other poem. Mmm, misbegotten monthly subscription fees. <laughs> I can't do it. On Tuesday, the United States Senate unanimously passed a bill that will make daylight saving time permanent, meaning no more spring forward or fall back, which everyone is totally cool with. So it was easy PR points for the collection of vacuous lickspittles and mewling sycophants who govern our illustrious nation. The bill would take effect in November 2023, and it's called the Sunshine Protection Act because self-absorbed politicians think they somehow have the power to control the sun. No, we're not saving daylight. We're not protecting sunshine. The Earth receives roughly the same amount of solar radiation every day, and we are just switching back to using clocks on a fixed 24-hour cycle like normal people. Now, let us never speak of this again. Thank you. Speaking of things we should never speak about, NFTs. You expect the likes of Mark Zuckerberg to be into them, so it's no surprise that Instagram will now be infested with people trying to convince you that NFTs are unique things that have value, with Meta inevitably skimming a commission off of every transaction, no doubt. But NFT creep is now affecting more and more businesses and needs to be called out if there's any hope of stopping it. It seems Spotify will be the next big company to dive in, as they've posted job listings looking for Web3 people to hire, with employee recruitment listings stating that they're building an experimental growth team. In my experience, experimental growths should be lanced and amputated, but what do I know? And then there's Winamp, who are also starting in with the NFT crap, tarnishing yet another piece of software that many of us have fond memories of. Not to worry though, if you do still want to whip the llama's ass, there's a Winamp plugin pack called the Winamp Community Update Project that you can use with the last good version of the music playback application, version 5.666, before the brand was acquired in 2014 by the douchebags who are now, yet again, attempting to sell nostalgia in NFT form by auctioning off the original Winamp skin. And yes, you can still use the original Winamp skin even after some sucker pays for the NFT version of it. NFTs are dumb. You know what's also dumb? The chip shortage, but take solace in the fact that it is continuing to get better and prices are continuing to go down. And as we look forward optimistically to the future with the renewed hope that springtime brings us, let's also consider that maybe in 2022 and beyond, chip shortages will be limited to Doritos making excuses for their shrinkflation projects. Really, Frito-Lay, five fewer chips per bag? I'm just gonna say it. I don't even like Doritos. I think they're totally overrated, but I do like ending the show. So there you have it guys, tech news for the week. And if you liked it, click that like button to trigger a pleasing dopamine release for both of us. Your feedback is always welcome. So please feel free to also leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested and check out my store at paulshardware.net for high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more. And if you're not subscribed, do note that it is highly recommended. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next week.